All right, well, as I just said, uh, my name is John Hogg. I'm an engineer at, at Bolt DB. I've been there for a while now. Um, we've uh, released version 3.2 recently, uh, so it, it's been out for several years. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about determinism in high throughput databases. This is something that we take a lot of advantage of in Bolt DB, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But this is a, a little bit more broadly, if not specific to Bolt DB as such. Um, talk a little bit, little bit about academic determinism and, and why it helps in these big databases. Uh, so, to start talking about determinism, uh, what, what my goal here is that I've got two databases, right? Two different machines, two different logical systems, and what I want to do is keep them in sync. So, the first thing I start doing is I run the same SQL against two different databases. Um, I'll run uh, So I can say create table, B days, with an integer and a date. Um, and I, if I run that statement on A and B, I'll end up with the same table. When you say um, different, what do you mean? When I say different. Different, different IPs or something? Yeah, I can have two, two, two different instances of MySQL running, two different instances of Postgres, two different. Do they have uh, the same data or they have different data? And so what I'm saying is that I can run the same operations on both. And they'll have the same data. So this is uh, so. So they're identical essentially. The uh, the goal is to keep them identical, and I'm going to talk about how determinism comes into play with that. Yeah, definitely stop me if I'm not being clear. This room isn't big enough that uh, that you know you have to hit, hold your questions to the end. In the worst case, I'll just say I'm going to get to that. So, um, but I'm happy to to stop. Uh, so I could say insert into B days. I can insert a birthday. I could say insert into B days. Like another birthday. Uh, I can say update birthdays, um, where id equals 2 to a different birthday. I can read from the birthdays. All these SQL statements, uh, if I apply them in the same order to both databases, I'm going to end up with the same state at the end. So here's the state I would end up with after running these four systems, uh, four SQL statements. So say uh, I have twins all of a sudden, or someone has twins, and I want to insert their birthday into this database. Uh, what's going to happen? Maybe I'd run SQL statements like insert into birthdays ID 3 current date, insert into birthdays ID 4 current date. Um, so why So why this is bad, why this is dangerous, the, the current date is not a deterministic function. So say that it's midnight and I run this statement. Um, when I run it on the first database, both of them make it in right before the computer turns to midnight. So I insert birthday January 31st, birthday January 31st. But on the second machine, the machine, you know, its internal clock changes from uh, January 31st to February 1st while I'm between these two SQL statements. So now what I've done is I've run the same SQL on both machines, but because I, you know, used wall clock time, I ended up with uh, two different pieces of data. So what I want is for this to be more like a connect four style database. I want to uh, put the same thing, say I'm going to put a red in column zero, I'm going to put a black in column four, a red in column one, a black in column six. I'm going to end up with uh, the same state down here in both of these databases. Um, so in order to get that in a SQL database, what I would need to do is use literal dates. So instead of letting the system pick the date using current date, I'd let my client application pick the date. This is not, you know, people are doing this kind of replication. This is a, you know, pretty, pretty basic one. Uh, but now I fix the data. So if you can think of the literal as the Connect4 database, then current date is basically the Plinko database. When you put the input in, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get out. The, the Plinko is the price is right game where you have to, you put the piece in the top and you want the money at the bottom to be 10,000. I certainly don't want it to be a uh, zero, um, but it, it's sort of up to chance. So, listing sources of non-determinism in, in a database like a, like a MySQL or a Vault or, or any real system that uses kind of operations more than just get and put. Um, wall clock time is a big one. Um, that's one we covered. Uh, randomness is also very similar to wall clock time. If you ask the system for a random number, the odds that two machines are going to give you the same random number without any special handling of the seed is pretty low. Um, so you can 
you can get around this, like the same thing with date. You can pick a random number in your client and insert that as a literal. Um, depending on the storage engine design, this depends on the system you're using. Um, I think InnoDB doesn't have this problem as often, but um, Postgres has this problem. Other, other storage engines might have this problem. Tuple order in some of these databases isn't deterministic. Um, so we could bring back the twins. Um, one thing I could do is I could say delete from birthdays um, where I, you know, I delete basically the, the newest baby. Um, and because the newest baby is a tie, um, it's perfectly valid SQL that I delete ID 3 over here and ID 4 over here. So that, that's also a source of determinism you have to be aware of. Sometimes uh, your data structure is always going to put things in the same order. Uh, a lot of tree-based structures, B-tree structures do this. Um, and other times, you know, they don't, they don't. External systems are also a big source of non-determinism. So uh, if this is a stored procedure or if this is some code that you're going to be running more than once in the different systems, beginning a transaction, asking the, uh, the NOAA, I forget what it stands for, but it's the weather people, asking them what the weather is and then storing it in the database. If I run this twice on two different systems, it's possible that that system says, oh, well, in between the two calls, you know, the, the wind has actually gone up a little bit since you asked. Um, so the right way to do this is to move calls to external systems outside of transactional context. So if your client gets the weather, then you can apply that, that single right uh, as many times as you want to different systems, and you'll get deterministic results. So we're going to get to why, why do this, but are there any questions about <coughs> sources of determinism, what determinism is, anything like that? All right. So the reason why this is important um, is, is database logging. Um, so logging, essentially, uh, part of most modern SQL relational systems, as well as a lot of non-relational systems, you record uh, all the information of what's changing to, to a log. Uh, this also could be called a journal in a lot of systems. It's basically the same thing. Uh, for d local durability, you can write that log to disk along with whatever other persistence mechanism you have. Uh, and for replication, you can send that log across a network to another node. Um, so there's two kinds of logging that are, that are really interesting, I think. Uh, there's binary logging, which is probably the most common kind of logging. So what binary logging does, it logs changes to the data, and then it sends those changes to disk or to another machine. So an example is set Larry's salary to 75K. That would be the change that you can make. As opposed to logical logging, uh, where you log the operations, the things that you're asking the systems to do uh, in a fixed order. You can replay those operations in a fixed order to get back to the same state. Uh, and these require fit the determinism. So for another example, you know, give Larry a raise of 3K. That's, if you think of that more as an operation, um, I could go into you know, the SQL, but you guys can probably all fill in the blanks. Uh, so giving Larry a raise of 3K is, is more of an operation because it depends on what Larry's salary is now. That's a different, different kind of operation. But it could be a whole stored procedure, a whole set of SQL, uh, kind of come into a couple examples. So uh, give Larry a raise versus set Larry's salary. Those are sort of logical versus binary. Um, a logical operation might be delete any records before January 1st. That depends on what's in the system. Uh, whereas the, the binary operation could be delete the following records, and it would actually just list all the changes, all the records below before January 1st. So in terms of space efficiency, um, sometimes logical wins, as in this case. However, in this case, uh, you could set Julie's first name to Susan, and then you could set Julie's first name to Julie, or set Susan's first name to Julie. Um, these operations cancel each other out. So in the logical log, you'd have a bunch of things that cancel each other out. In the binary log, you'd have nothing. So you know these kind of things. That depending on what you're doing, they have pros and cons. Um, I'm really interested in logical uh, logging, and I'm going to get, get why. Um, but to do logical logging right, I said that you have to have deterministic operations. Um, you also need serializable isolation in the system. Um, now, now you may only need that while you're replaying the log. It depends on a lot of things. But you need very, very strong consistency in order to assume that if you replay the same set of things in the same order, you're going to end up with the same state. Uh, serializable is easy for kind of key value document stores. You just say, here are the puts and here are the gets in this order. You don't actually need the gets. Um, but for a relational database, uh, serializable is not the default 
uh, con consistency uh, setting for most systems. Uh, usually it slows things down quite a bit. So um, looking at asynchronous replication or logging, uh, logical or binary log, I made a chart of sort of all the different things. I don't necessarily need to go into all of this, but if you look at space efficiency, execution speed, latency, determinism, um, in, in all these categories, logical logging, binary logging, it depends on your workload whether one might be better than another. Um, sort of determinism and latency are sort of where one beats the other kind of depending on, on what you're looking at. So if you look at synchronous replication and logging, uh, where you want to write to the log before you respond to the client that your transaction is committed, um, or it's rolled back, or, or whatever, um, I'm going to argue that logical wins big time, um, if it's possible. It's not always possible, depending on what you're doing. But, but when you're able to do logical, uh, it has huge advantages in synchronous replication. So. So, in terms of um, performing operation on on the slave, for example, with the synchronous replication, you have to wait until a slave finishes the queries and the master is, is, is stuck with that. Do you think it is an advantage? So this is a huge. So I'm not talking about synchronous versus asynchronous. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is synchronous. Uh, uh, when you when you want to write to a log synchronously, then logical logging is going to have advantages over. Um, binary logging. And what, what you speak to, one of the biggest ones is latency. If I have a binary log, what I need to do is apply an operation to my, my master server. Um, and, then, and then I take the log that's generated, the changes that are generated at the end, and I send them to, to the replica server. That replica server then applies them. Um, I have to do one and then the other. If I have determinism, if I have a uh, logical logging, what I can do is I can send the same operation to both servers at the same time and have them do the operation in parallel. So this gets me in terms of a, a, a latency, it gets me a much, much lower latency because I can start both at the same time. So if I have to wait until they're both done, they might as well be working at the same time. Uh, the other thing that's really nice about logical log for synchronous replication is synchronous replication typically involves a network. Um, and that, Traditionally, networks are a lot slower than disks. That's becoming less true these days. But uh, logical logging is bounded in size, typically by what the input is. So if I have a gigabit connection to my server and I'm sending logical requests over that gigabit connection, um, then in the worst case, the description of the logical changes to the database fit on a gigabit connection on the way out. Um, it's very hard for logical to blow up by 10x, whereas it's very possible for binary to either shrink by 10x or blow up by 10x. Uh, the example of you know, the logical operation is delete everything before January 1st. The binary log for that could be enormous. Uh, so in this case, you've got a bounded size uh, on the logical replica. And again, determinism is required to do this well. So can you think of it as a difference between um, a vector graphic and a bit more graphic? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're good for different things, right? right? So the vector graphic and the bitmap graphic, you wouldn't want to represent a photo as a vector, typically. And you wouldn't want to represent line art as a bitmap, typically. Um, so, but that, that's kind of the similar idea. Um, depending on what you're doing, they could be very different. But if you're doing a lot of line art, you'd want to stick to vectors. And so for synchronous replication, typically, you get a lot of these benefits um, with the, ca the ca caveat that you have to have deterministic operations. So um, basically, I'm saying that determinism and logical log-based replication <coughs> together get you a tremendous set of advantages. Um, now, these advantages are multiplied when your logical operations get more complicated. So another thing you can work into the mix is stored procedure logic. Uh, so if I want to order a pizza, um, one thing I can do is I can just basically call up the pizza place, and this worked reasonably well tonight. I can call up the pizza place and say, hey, I'd like a large pizza I'd like uh, with ham and olives. One message back and forth, at least that's how it's supposed to work. Um, and, and that's a very brief, very short, logical way to express a complex process of someone making a pizza. So, but the way that a lot of times we use these systems with uh, either with the ORMs uh, using making many calls back and forth to the database, um, or even our client app, the back and forth, um, 
I have to go over my JDBC connection or my MySQL client and say, well, you know, first I want you to knead the dough, then I want you to spread the sauce in the dough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These all many back and forth round trips. Um, expressing this logically is not super small, but uh, expressing the, the call to a store procedure logically compresses all this logical data down quite a bit. So going to the store and saying, you know, like a number five with fries. Same, same idea, you're, you're compressing a lot of logical information. So you're adding more benefits to your, uh, to your store, uh, sorry, to the benefits of uh, logical replication with determinism. So here's a more concrete example. Um, if I want to display an ad, uh, I've got the user session ID and I've got a URL for the, the page that I'm trying to display an ad on. That, the, what ad to display could be represented in store procedure logic. Um, but typically, a lot of times, what happens with these systems is they, they make several calls back and forth to a database to decide what to do the ad. Um, so not only is the thing on the left a lot smaller, but it's also the latency is substantially reduced. So th these are two things that, that Volt DB uses, basically. Um, everything is logical log-based, and everything is deterministic. And VoltDB, uh, basically every transaction is either a single SQL statement or it's a stored procedure. So that every transaction in the system is, is, can logically be described pretty briefly um, as, as a stored procedure call with parameters, as a SQL statement, um, and can be, sorry, and can be, uh, can be uh, replicated synchronously. So this is sort of what we've built the Connect4 database. Um, and so when we're trying to keep A and B in sync, what we define is basically A and B are now a cluster. They, they can communicate, they have a mesh, they understand that each other. They're trying to maintain identical state. Um, and so what we do is say you've sent two stored procedure calls to B, three stored procedure calls to A. Um, we will send them all to one place. They will be ordered so that they'll have a deterministic order. Um, and each of these stored procedures are themselves deterministic. We'll send them back to, uh, to both nodes saying you guys have to execute these five stored procedures. We send them, uh, basically send the responses back to one node, whichever node is the sort of initiator of, the, of these transactions. Um, and then they'll go back to whoever, they, whoever has the client connection to get sent. So this is sort of a, <coughs> I think, I believe, a couple, two round trips. Um, internally, if you send uh, to, to um, <coughs> perform transactional logic, um, as, and this is, sorry, sorry. And what this is doing is in, in per transaction, you have to have at least two, two round trips. However, uh, you can batch these together so that you can have 100 transactions come in all be batched together so that the, so the two get sent over here, and they get sent back. You don't have one line per transaction. Uh, so you can get a, a lot, uh, sorry, so while you have a, a bit of a pipeline, you can get, uh, for a smaller number of messages, you can get a tremendous amount of work done, yes. What determines the batch size? Uh, so what actually, it's actually, uh, it actually, the networking stack sort of determines the batch size. Things are, so what happens is when the calls arrive, uh, they're route, each sort of procedure will get assigned uh, to a, sort of a home location, um, a, a temporary master for that particular uh, piece of data that it needs to access. Um, and they'll all be pushed into a network buffer there. Those, those network buffers will be based on, on the size of the network buffer. It could be variable. Um, but they'll be pushed basically as fast as we can internally in the cluster. So if you're not doing a lot of work, the batch size could be one. And if you're doing a tremendous amount of work, the batch size gets bigger just based on the networking stack. Yeah? So is this, uh, this is system level or does it assume that every client application only makes procedures? So it assumes that, that, that multi-statement transactions are written as stored procedures. Uh, single statement transactions, so you can connect with a JDBC connection or a, you know, any of our native clients and you can run single SQL statements against it. Um, but if you want to do transactional logic, it requires a stored procedure. And that's something where right now stored procedures are written in Java. Um, I can 
show you examples uh, afterward. But uh, but you know we we we're working on making that a little bit more flexible. So, what do I get because I'm using determinism, stored procedures, <coughs> logical logging? I can have a three-node cluster with three copies of all the data, and because this is this is synchronous logging, say say uh, I can run over a hundred thousand transactions per second. I can do this synchronously, so that the transaction, when it gets back to the client, it's been committed in three places. I can do it with less than a millisecond of latency. Uh, this is. Uh, and basically all of your data is stored as the memory as the primary storage. Um, if I want to do synchronous disk log on, on, on these nodes in addition to the replication between the nodes, I have to add a few milliseconds per <coughs> transaction. Um, but that does not affect throughput of the system. So I can, I can do in Volt with three nodes uh, 100,000 synchronous operations where I've written it to disk in three places, I've written it to memory in three places, all within a few milliseconds, two or three. Um, that depends on, on what hardware you have, but that's not fantastic hardware. We do that on $4,000 servers, um, probably cheaper at this point, because those are now a few years old. And one of the things about this example is uh, the hundreds of thousands of transactions per second has nothing to do with the amount of SQL we're running. A lot of that is the overhead of doing transactional work, of, of creating a transaction, synchronously logging the transactions, uh, like I said, this could be order a pizza, where it's very easy to synchronously log that, but the actual logic could be quite complex. So one of the standard benchmarks we, we run that gets 100,000 uh, pretty easily on one machine um, uh, has about four or five SQL statements per transaction. Uh, it does some, co uh, some contingent updates, basically. Uh, so you can add that kind of very tr hard transactional serializable logic to your transactions. Um, and still get very good performance. So if I added more SQL to that, it probably wouldn't slow, slow down the system. A lot of what we have in, in many VoltDB applications, uh, we're limited on networking um, more than we're limited on CPU. Uh, so it's, and then once we're not limited on networking, we're very often limited on uh, basically ordering the transactions, not on executing them. So we do have, one of the catches with this kind of system is that if you have a 32 core, four socket, big honking machine, um, we don't yet get tremendous performance on that uh, beyond what like a half that two socket 16 core machine would get. Uh, it's something we're working on, but right now if you have two 16 core machines, we'll get almost double the performance. It's very linearly scalable as you add machines, um, but, but we're working on making it linearly scalable internally. So you will run most of your queries in memory, right? We, so we, we store all data in memory across the cluster. So your database has to fit in the memory of the cluster um, divided by the amount of redundancy you want. Now we'll store things on disk <coughs> persistently below that, um, either asynchronously or synchronously. Um, but, but the actual size of the data is limited um, by, by memory. And we have in production deployments that are greater than a terabyte right now. A terabyte of logical data with, with redundancy on top of that. So. You can, have a very you can have a very large amount of memory. It's not large uh, in terms of analytic databases, but you can have a fairly large operational store in memory, and uh, it'll probably cost you less than Oracle license as well. <coughs> so uh, if you're interested in more of this kind of determinism stuff, uh, there's a really interesting research paper. Um, Alex Thompson's a guy I work with doing some research. He, he, he's sort of the head author on this Calvin paper. And this is a system that goes way beyond what Volt does, uh, sort of inspired by Volt, and then went beyond that to say, uh, if we make even for more assumptions about determinism, can we get even more through throughput, even more flexibility? Uh, and he's sort of, I, I believe he's, he's working on more, uh, more concrete implementations of this, uh, but it's a really interesting uh, paper if you want to see how determinism and SQL databases can kind of work together. Um, so the last section of the talk, I want to talk about uh, what happens when you're not deterministic and you think you are, what happens when it goes wrong, um, and it does go wrong. Um, we, we spent a lot of time trying to learning about <laughs> how to detect this stuff. I'm going to, so yes. So it sounds like the system <coughs> as it's currently designed is essentially an in-memory database that uses this as a backup store? Yes. But it's a clustered in-memory database. Yes. But I guess I'm wondering, in terms of the 
Yeah. Well, don't take my word for it, but we mopped the floor with other in-memory databases. Um, that's basically because we've made a lot of choices that other people haven't made. We're not a, a drop-in re replacement for MySQL, um, which is challenging sometimes. We don't, we're not compatible with ORMs, uh, so people who want to run Hibernate or Active Record or any of these things, uh, they have a hard time moving to VoltDB. So we've made some compatibility trade-offs. We ask you to write a lot of your stuff in stored procedures. Uh, but because we've structured this as, as a, I can go into a little bit more about why the architecture of the system is faster. It's not entirely the determinism, but that's, that's a big part of it. Um, but it's also, uh, the, the, we've made some architectural decisions that have given us uh, not necessarily the fastest read throughput in the world, but certainly the fastest write throughput. So if you want to modify state in multiple places or modify it on disk, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's not even close to the next best competitor. So if you compare with NDB, MySQL, NDB cluster, yes. uh, we will have some advantages because the architecture is relatively mm -hmm. similar. There are some similarities, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, let, let, me, let me come back to some of this after I just finish this stuff. So I'm happy to answer a bunch of questions. But, yeah, I can talk about uh, MySQL cluster and some of the differences. Um, so what happens when I have a poison log? And, and I look at a poison log as I've got a bunch of deterministic operations, but then somewhere in there there's an operation that isn't deterministic. Maybe somebody's written a stored procedure that uses current date, um, and, and for you know, VoltDB wasn't able to detect that, or the system in question wasn't able to detect that. So how how do you detect that you've got non-determinism? Uh, so we've tried a couple different things. What we've ultimately settled on is that we will hash the DML, that is the 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 write SQL statements that you do in your transaction. We'll keep a running hash for a given transaction, and then what we'll do is we'll compare that hash as a result, with the results from two, trans, two replicas running the same operation. So if I end up somehow inserting something that's slightly different uh, in one transaction or inserting something slightly different in another replica, uh, then the system will detect that and we can take whatever steps we deem appropriate. I'll get to that in a second. Um, we do not let you run, do anything non-deterministic in SQL. So if you ask us in SQL for the date, or you ask our APIs in Java for the date, we're always going to give you a deterministic date. Same thing with random numbers. We're always going to give you a deterministic random number. Uh, so that's all safe to use if you use our SQL or our APIs. If you're writing a Java store procedure and you use the Java APIs, you're not guaranteed anything yet. Uh, I'm sure that in a future version of Vault, we'll detect that and tell you stop using those APIs. Um, at least in simple cases, something we've been more playing around with. Um, but for now, that, that's, that's one of the ways you can introduce non-determinism. You can either, you can call the Java random function, you can call out to another system from within your stored procedure, um, and we need to be able to detect that. So we will detect if you take that non-determinism and try to change some state with it in your database. Um, so crash recovery uh, is, the other, is the other case where I've got, uh, I've got a log and I've got a poison um, transaction, what, what we do at Volt is we'll replay up to the failed transaction. Uh, so, well, technically what we'll do is we'll replay, and notice you have a failed transaction, uh, 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 go back to the beginning and replay up to the transaction right before the failed transaction. That's the best we can do. So that's one of the downsides. We can't, we can give you, say, tell you what these transactions were, but if you want a consistent database between your two systems, and that's very, very important to us, uh, we, will, we, we basically say the system promises that it is at all times perfectly consistent and it won't let you be not consistent. Uh, so this, so when, things become, when things become not consistent, we get real draconian real fast. Uh, so the user can decide what to do with that stuff. For async replication, where I've got a master and a replica, uh, VoltDB uses this for uh, WAN replication. So if you have a cluster in Boston and a cluster in in Oregon or something, um, we'll do an async replication of the logical stream to that cluster. If there's a bad uh, transaction there, um, basically we stop, we stop the world and we do a full sync, uh, which is something, again, real draconian, not something we'd like to do, something we'd like to do less of in the future when we detect that, but we, we, non-determinism is something to keep out of the system. Uh, so within a cluster, yes? 
No. Sometimes. <laughs> Typically, no. <laughs> um, what, what, this, what I'm specifically talking about here is when I've got a transaction that, that executes given with one answer on the primary, and then the secondary gives a different answer. Um, this is, usually you will catch non-deterministic transactions on the master uh, before you'll catch them in this scenario. There's, you know, uh, adversarial ways I can think of to come into this credit procedure that'll get you in this situation. Um, yes, right. So yeah, if you want, I can talk to what VoltDB does in, in the case of network flips. That's something that we deal with a lot. Um, so within a cluster, we do synchronous replication between all, uh, between all our replicas. So if I have a, a three node volt cluster and I want uh, triple redundancy, I'll do synchronous operations on all three nodes. If I have a 10 node volt cluster, I can still ask for triple redundancy and just all data is gonna be in three places somewhere in that cluster. Um, what happens if I have a non-deterministic transaction? Uh, volt will actually detect this. It will snapshot the cluster at the last known good state. So it'll do a transactional snapshot to disk and then it will stop the cluster and let the user figure out what to do next. Again, draconian. Uh, so the nice thing about uh, building a set of sto stored procedures, a set of uh, SQL statements that you can call in VoltDB, uh, the only way that you can introduce <coughs> non-determinism into VoltDB today is to write a stored procedure that does something wacky. Uh, single SQL statements can't be non-deterministic. Uh, so you can call single SQL all you want, uh, but you have to write something non-deterministic to run into these cases. The nice thing about having a set of procedures that you can excuse me, deploy onto your database is that typically you can test these things out, you can run them in tests, and this kind of situation would be detected in test if you run into it at all. Now when you say let the user sort it out, you mean it stop, really stops, it's not like, okay. Yep. The, the transactions, they just stop? <laughs> uh, yeah, so everything that we've said is committed has been committed and is safe in that snapshot on disk. Okay. We haven't responded, when we get to the non-deterministic transaction, we won't respond to the client <coughs> and say, you know, we did this, or anything beyond that, we won't say we did this. So everything we've told the client is committed is committed, but we will stop the system at that point. You will lose availability if you have a non-deterministic transaction. So what's a user supposed to do in that case? Um, <coughs> typically what a user does is they reload from the snapshot um, and they, go on with their business manually repairing things. This is not something we've run into in production very often. It's something we've run into in tests several times. Um, but I, I can say in production, I think we've run into it two or three times. And, we've, and we haven't run into it since we switched to the DML hashing. Um, so we, we've done some things that have made it a little bit harder to hit. Um, so one of the examples, this is, this is a compiler output from our stored procedures. So we have a stored procedure compiler that takes your Java, compiles all the SQL, um, and it will give you a little report. This report has been improved since I took this shot. Um, but one of the things we do is we add a non-determinism warning if we detect anything might be non-deterministic. Um, this is, you know, basically uh, there's, there's some SQL statement in the vote procedure that might be fed into a write SQL statement that might return rows in, a non, in an order that is might be non-deterministic, et cetera. So, so this doesn't warn you today if you call uh, Java util date or, or uh, the Java random method or if you call out to another system with a socket. Um, it doesn't do any code inspection, but it takes a look at your SQL. And if, you're gonna, if you do something that isn't uh, deterministic, you can usually fix this by adding an order by somewhere. So, so yeah, so the things that we've done to make this um, we've tried to call attention to it. We've done a lot of things that make it harder to do it by accident. Um, we detect it quickly if you do do this. Um, and when things go south, we've added more options <coughs> for what to do with it. So we will re now, we, we used to not be able to replay a log that had a poison transaction in it. Now we'll replay a log to the point where it failed. Um, and this is the something that marketing came up with as a slogan that and I'd like to include on my slides because it, I don't know, it's just the gap between marketing and engineering. <laughs> but uh, but th thank you very much, guys. I can answer questions for as long as you guys need them. Yes? What are some examples of companies or industries that use uh, your data? Um, so uh, one thing I can just say, if you go to our website, there's a bunch of 
examples of how people use our website, uh, use our product. Um, there's some examples in digital ad tech. Uh, one of my favorite examples of what somebody's doing that's just really, really cool with Volt that I don't think is really possible with a lot of other systems. Um, there's this company called Yellowhammer, and what they do is they place ads for other companies on big banner homepages like MSN.com. And when you buy ads with MSN.com, you need to buy a tremendous number of them. And then they tell you what happened in terms of how many people clicked on them, sometimes 24 hours or more later. Uh, they're real slow. Uh, they also require you to, uh, to give them all the assets. So you don't get logs right away. You get logs later. So what this company has done is that they've created a, a flash container for each of their customers that, uh, that has a bunch of callouts bunch of text, a bunch of different images. And what happens is when it loads up in the, uh, when it loads up MSN, the flash container pings out to VoltDB and says, okay, I'm, I'm drawing a page for this user. Uh, what would you like? And VoltDB says, well, try this call out here and this image here. And it will create uh, on the fly a, a, a banner ad for a customer. And then if the customer clicks it, it will send to VoltDB, okay, that got clicked. You know, they got moused over but didn't get clicked. It will send that information back to VoltDB. And what happens is that VoltDB is tracking what kind of callouts got clicked for this customer in real time. And so what it, it's sort of like an A-B test where you, know, you go past the end of the alphabet then times 10,000. You can show you know, 100, 100 different images and 10,000 different pieces of text. You very quickly converge on what gets clicked. Um, and so they can do this with Volt because Volt is cheaper than other systems at that scale. So they can do you know, 100,000 operations a second, and the cost of those operations is still cheaper than the cost of putting that ad on a, you know, they've got a budget for how much they pay to put it on MSN, they've got how much they charge their user. They need VoltDB to get them this information a lot cheaper than like an Exadata could get them this information. Um, so the cost per transaction is very low for them. It allows them to, to solve this problem and get customers live analytics on what's being clicked and allows them to show them, you know, these are the call-ups that are working, these are the images that are working. So that's kind of a, a cool use case that's described. There's, a, there's an ISP in Japan, one of the, the second biggest ISP in Japan, sends all their router traffic through VoltDB to look for distributed denial of services. Um, and then VoltDB will ping their desktops in their little knock that says, hey, you, know, you should check out these IPs. They're doing something wacky. Um, and that's something that they, 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 they basically use the free version of VoltDB and then they pay for it so they can ask us about you know, query optimization. Um, there's a, there's a bunch of use cases in um, uh, online gaming. Uh, somebody just went live with a big online gaming platform powered by Volt. Again, it's the kind of thing where they like the transactionality of VoltDB, they like the throughput of VoltDB, and they like the cost of VoltDB. Uh, so it's, not, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more work to build an app on VoltDB than it is to build an app on MySQL. Um, but the, the cost per transaction at that scale uh, makes it really valuable for them. Uh, yeah. Can you just describe what that architecture is like? What would it be to go from you know, MySQL to the Sure. Are you a straight A to die, or are you a live in one? Uh, par pardon? Me. How, how what's the architecture to do? Typically, your Volt application is going to be uh, a set of relational tables, just like it would be in other systems. However, you're going to specify for each table, this is going to be a partition table, and it's going to partition on this column or this is going to be a replicated table and it's going to be replicated everywhere. Good for dimension tables, lookup tables, things that don't change as often. Um, and then you're going to build a set of, of SQL statements that you can call or a set of stored procedures. Um, and then on top of that you can send, uh, so, so then when you build your application, you choose a, a VoltDB client library, whether it's uh, the J JDBC client, whether it's a HTTP REST client, uh, or whether it's one of our native clients in a bunch of languages. Your app will be, uh, you can call ad hoc SQL, you can call SQL statements you've pre-planned, pre or you can call stored procedures. And you'll, you'll do that logic, it will return a set of results. Um, it's because of the transactional model, the transactional model is send one, um, send one message to the system that contains everything you need for your, database, for your database transaction. It will either commit or roll back entirely everywhere. It will come back to you and tell you, here, this committed, this rolled back, here was the error if, if it did. Um, but it's not a back and forth thing. Uh, so that makes it really difficult to work transactionally with ORMs, uh, your hibernates, active records, et cetera. So if you're using those, it's more of a change if you're using that kind of system. Um, it's the easiest kind of applications to build, the place where people say this isn't a big deal at all, 
is where you've got a huge message processing stream where for each message you've got to do some transactional logic. Um, and then you're drawing, uh, and then you separately, you've got some dashboard where you want to know what's going on. So we see this a lot. Uh, an example might be in banking, um, people doing risk management in, for uh, online trading apps. The exchange is coming back with a set of messages about what you're doing. Um, maybe that rate for some of these bigger uh, hedge funds or, or high frequency trading systems could be you know, 500,000 uh, messages from the exchange. And each message comes into a Volt store procedure which updates some state internally. Maybe it updates some materialized views, updates a bunch of tables, does some transactional logic that is totally transactional. And then separately from that, they, the traders may have a dashboard that says, ah, you know, the company-wide position on Microsoft is this, so I shouldn't go deep on Microsoft because we're already so deep. I would just be making, you know, I should go deep somewhere else. Um, that's sort of a, a, a common thing, but we see that a lot. Um, gaming tends to look like that. The, the network stuff looks like that. The telco stuff looks like that. You've typically got something that's happening at tremendous volume and then you've got this kind of uh, other process of trying to figure out what, what is going on with the thing that's happening at tremendous volume. Uh, another, another use case is, is similar, but taking that thing at tremendous volume and then processing it into a downstream system. So either deduplification, we've got a marathon use case where they're tracking uh, RFIDs and bibs, and as they run by the bibs, there's like 50 people running by the tracker at once, and so the RFID can't really calibrate, so it may register somebody 400 times in a few microseconds. Uh, it's very annoying to dedupe this as people are running by. So they have a van full of Volt DB uh, that dedupes everything as it's coming in, and then the stream of actual bibs is just one message per person running out of bib. And they can also send out a stream from Volt DB. Um, so what they do is they do timing. They'll text you your time as you run by one of these things, but they'll also text your friend who's you know maybe a mile ahead on the left waiting to cheer you on or give you some water that, hey, your friend's about to run by. Um, and that stream of, uh, you know, the, the message is uh, Dave ran by this tracker, uh, but what VoltDB can do internally is say, okay, well, who's interested in that message? And within the transactional context can look and see, ah, well, I'm going to need to put this into this, you know, SMS queue so that I want to send these messages out. And that can come out the, the back end of VoltDB uh, into another system. But we see people doing that kind of thing, reducing data for Hadoop, reducing data for analytic systems. Uh, we, we've got people who've integrated us with uh, everything from MySQL to Vertica uh, to Cassandra, um, lots of different systems. Uh, I have two questions. The first one, um, the examples which you presented, many examples, um, you have a lot of uh, data and it, uh, sometimes experimental ones, uh, so kind of to lose a couple of samples is not so important. Uh, by the content of your example. From another point, you emphasize transactionality, which cares about each particular item precisely. Mm -hmm. Don't you see any kind of contradiction here? Well, I think that the, the wh where you can keep that data, it, it's often very important. I mean, in the online gaming case, if I sold Shiri a sword in my online game, <coughs> You know, she's going to want that sword, right? But the thing is, I don't want to pay to do a heavyweight Oracle transaction to do that every time somebody's exchanging a sword, because then I'd need, you know, the setup thing where you know there's a, a thousand people on a server instead of fifty thousand people on a server. And I make money when there's fifty thousand people on a server. So that there's also the finance industry. If I miss a message from the exchange, That's that could be hugely important. Yes. Um, maybe it's not so bad if I miss a guy running by a, a tracker, um, but I still don't want to. It's, I mean, it would be, it's, it's certainly better for my business not to. But the transactional logic of it is more than just it's transactional in that it's not losing data. Uh, we have people who run VoltDB with, with synchronous disk durability. We have people who run VoltDB with no durability at all. One node, no durability. The J Japanese guys who track all the ISP traffic, they don't use any redundancy at all. So if the system goes down, they just bring it back up. They've lost their history. Um, so that, that's an example of maybe the, the importance of the data. But the other thing you can do is the transactional logic. Uh, so one of the companies that we have, uh, we have a benchmark that does this, and we have a, a company that does this. Actually, we wrote the benchmark first, um, and I'll explain what that is. And then we actually sold this benchmark to a couple different companies. Um, we wrote this as a mock-up of an American Idol voting system where in the commercial, everyone texts in their vote. And so what the logic is, it's different than just uh, you know, my phone number and a put. 
What it is is, is I'm going to read my phone number. I'm going to make sure it's a valid phone number. It's not blacklisted, etc. Then I'm going to take that phone number and I'm going to count how many times has that phone number voted before. So I have a limit to how many times each phone number can vote. Um, and so I've got this conditional logic that decides whether or not I'm allowed to vote for the candidate. Is the candidate valid? Um, I can do all this transactionally. And because it's serializable, it's transactional, if somebody's text messaging from the same phone you know, quickly, those transactions are, I'm never going to allow somebody to vote 11 times. Um, now, maybe you know, the American Idol people, they don't care if it's perfect voting or not. They don't care if it's off by a bit. But um, you, could, you, know, you could see, like, there are other, we've actually sold that app to a bunch of different gaming companies, to some television companies. There's been some Japanese game shows and a Canadian game show uh, that have all basically used VoltDB for exactly that purpose. Um, so they're doing not just the data is important, but they're doing transactional conditional logic in the store procedure. So to them, they just call a message saying, hey, this SMS number is voting for Fred. Um, but internally to VoltDB, all the validation is right there in the little bit of code. And about indexes, the question. Do you use indexes in your search? Yeah, yeah. We're in memory, which makes you fast, but it doesn't fix any orders of magnitude problem, right? You get, maybe memory is, is two orders of magnitude faster than disk. Maybe with SSDs, it's only one. Uh, it depends. But, um, but you know, searching an index could be you know, a million times faster than scanning a table. So we still have all the same kind of in SQL internals problems that everyone else has. We just have in-memory data structures instead of on-disk data structures. Instead of disk fragmentation, we worry about in-memory fragmentation. Uh, so we have a lot of custom allocators, that kind of thing. But we do indexes, uh, different kinds of indexes. Um, we do uh, materialized views, very popular in Volt, um, so that you can pay the cost of updating some co a complex view um, for every event, which is sort of amortized cost, so that when you do the lookup, they can be very quick. So in the American Idol example, uh, you can have materialized views rolled up by state, so you can get a quick dashboard of which states are voting for which contestants. You could have rolled up by, by time, et cetera. You could build those into your application. Yeah. Do you have uh, use cases when banks use it uh, for uh, payments processing? Not many, and no. It's, it's really, like, I, I was, it seems like it's a perfect application, but uh, I assume there are some issues in the well, uh, I think that payment processing, when there's actual money involved, uh, we have one deployed app where there's a website that sort of has fake money that's actually tied to real money that goes through Volt. But otherwise, there's not much in terms of real money. There's a lot of online currencies and things moving through Volt. I think people are very conservative um, with real money. A lot of times, these things aren't used. You, you hear a lot of people, if you read um, um, sort of the the no sequel, the, the eventual consistency compared to the consistency about a lot of times the, one of the big examples is, you know, well, banks, they don't really use transactions. They use uh, reconciling logs, um, which is kind of a strange argument because it's also very different than what eventual consistency, dynamo style eventual consistency actually looks like. But, um, but yeah, it, it's not... Uh, People, I think it's mostly it's people are, are very conservative and they, and they do this system by habit of these reconciling logs. So there's sort of trails of, of where the money was at every point. And Volt, I don't know, it's not, it's not uh, super useful there yet, I guess. It's very entrenched systems, maybe in a few years. But auditing, for example, is difficult with your architecture, right? Well, not, no, not necessarily. I mean, people, we can store, we have, we have a... We have a, a, a system uh, we call uh, export from Volt TV, which I alluded to when I said we could push to other systems. Uh, so Volt sort of has an input side, which is just that I'd like to call a procedure, call, run a SQL statement, get a result set. But I can also push things out of it through an export channel, um, which is uh, sort of like a, a, like a, like a uh, message queue type system, but it's designed for streaming high velocity data. But people use that as, as audit logs. so they'll. They'll push something to the expert that says this is what happened, where the internal state will just, they'll just change it internally, but the log will show what the series of transitions are. <laughs> um, I, I think it's just that people who have money are really conservative with new technology. Uh, and also, the, the money scale, um, very often, um, actual you know, money doesn't change hands at the rates that VoltDB needs. So there, there are apps around money that, that, that Volt is using. But if you look at how often they actually, I mean, if you're not Visa, then it's not, it's not, the rates aren't in the hundreds of thousands. The rates are, you know, I, I, will, I will say there, um, I remembered something that maybe contracts it. The, the stock exchanges in Malaysia, Poland, 
um, and one more country are running on Volt DB at this point. Um, so we have a couple of financial apps where, where real people's data is being, is being run. Um, I'm not sure if Poland is in production, but I know Bursa Malaysia is. Yeah. You mentioned partitioning. Is that done dynamically or statically, or how do you decide how you're going to spread things around the cluster? So if you download Volt today, what you do is you specify your table uh, one column. You say this is my hash column. Maybe it's a primary key. Maybe it's a maybe you want a partition based. You know, if you've got a finance app, you might partition on ticker symbol, for example. So all your Microsoft operations would go one place, um, and then operations that did rollups might have to go everywhere. Um, that that's very static right now. So you can start up a cluster. You say I've got ten, <coughs> ten nodes, um, and it will partition everything to the ten nodes evenly. If you need to add another node, what you need to do is shut down the system, add another node, and restart it. We will rebalance on startup, um, but not live. Uh, this summer, we plan to release the add nodes on the fly. Uh, people have been asking for it for a, for a long time. It's it's a lot harder to do with a SQL system that's running at velocity <laughs> than it is with the key value stores. But uh, but that's something we're adding. Does it balance? Forgetting about the case of adding, does it rebalance if the spread of data across the bucket? Today, no. That's sort of that's it's in this part of the whole same problem. Same problem. So we're working on making the the, the, the balancing dynamic so that we can add new nodes. Um, there'll be a preview release of that shortly, um, and, and balance rebalancing within things is sort of the same problem. Yeah. Can you also talk a little bit about the cost? As you mentioned, that it's sort of sort of cost effective. And then uh, you mentioned some of these guys doing it for free. So like it seems like they're doing they're using it for an enterprise. So, so Volt DB has a, as a, a, it's sort of an open core model. Um, there's a, there's a free version you can download from our website. Uh, you can download the source code uh, from GitHub. Uh, you can build it yourself. Uh, it, it is basically the open source edition of Volt DB. Um, and then we have an enterprise edition of Volt DB, which is uh, the free version plus some additional features. Typically, the additional features. Uh, change depending on when you're at, you know, asking. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit of a movement in Volt to moving a little bit more of the features into the, the commercial version. Um, it's an open source question of you know, how to make money that I think everybody's trying to figure out at the same time. Um, but, uh, but typically, the features that you would want if you were going into production with something important are in the uh, commercial version. We do have some people who are running on, on the, in, in production with the open source version. Um, and pay for a commercial license and commercial support for it. Uh, and we have a lot of people who are using the open source version and don't pay, don't talk to us, and don't return our phone calls, um, which is good or bad depending on who you ask. <laughs> I mean, nobody thinks it's good, but people using Bolt is good. People not returning our phone calls is bad. That kind of thing. And what about the cost and how it's structured in terms of sure. charge per transaction, or just, just generally just like per use? Like so the, the, the pricing model, um, and I'm a little bit out of my element, but the, the pricing model is based on the number of nodes um, and the uh, rough transactional throughput you're looking to run. Um, so beyond that, it's very flexible. Um, and, and the ballpark price for this, um, I'm, this is being recorded, so I'm not sure what to say exactly. We, can, we don't have a price on. We can remove it in post. We can. The, we can pretend this question never happened. The question never happened. I think the average selling price at this point is is in the mid tens of thousands of dollars for clusters in the you know single digit numbers of sizes somewhere in there. Um, depending on what you're kind of trying to do, we have some people who are not who, who are, you know it's single digit thousands, and we have a bunch of deals that are you know triple digit thousands. Um, but uh, if you're interested, you can talk to me after this. If you you know. If you're interested academically or commercially, um, if you, uh, and also, like I said, I said at the beginning, we're hiring. Um, we're looking for engineers, I'm probably looking for other things too, but I care mostly about engineering. Um, so, uh, kind of all aspects of engineering. All right, thank, thank you very much, guys. Thank you.